This Filmmaker IQ course is sponsored by Ambient, manufacturers of precise location sound, time code, and sync equipment. Hi, John Hess from FilmmakerIQ.com. In today's course, we're going to explore the history and science of time code and how you can implement time code generators to make your production more efficient and precise. Even though the motion picture has been part of our cultural zeitgeist for more than one and a quarter century, frame accurate time code didn't actually materialize until the invention of videotape and more precisely, videotape editing. Still, traditional celluloid film needed some kind of reference system to identify where in the roll of film a shot originated from. In the first 20 years of film, this was simply done by an editor just marking up the negative and keeping copious notes. Well, then in 1919, Eastman Kodak began printing edge numbers as a latent image on unprocessed film. The numbers would start at zero and then go to 99,999 before it would start all over again. After the negative was exposed in the camera and processed, these codes would appear at every foot of 35 millimeter film and every six inches of 16 millimeter film. The post-production process would first make a copy of the original camera negative, create a work print positive for the editor to work with to create an edited cut. Then from that edited positive work print film, you could go back and match up the edge numbers with the original camera negative to cut a master negative, which would be copied to create positive release prints. Now, as filmmaking went further along, they added interpositives and internegatives, but you can kind of see how edge numbers plays into the organization of celluloid post-production. And that was really pretty much good enough for celluloid folks because editing film was still a tactile experience and you could easily see what frame you were working on. It wasn't until the 1990s that Kodak introduced something called key code, which is essentially a machine readable version of edge numbers. But let's back up to the 1950s and introduce a major new competitor to film, television. Now the moving picture was being broadcast through the air, like radio. It was no longer a piece of plastic you could feel and see in your hands. Now recording this signal to something called videotape would follow not too far behind with Ampex releasing their first video tape recorder, the Ampex VRX 1000, some later called the Mark IV, in 1956. A videotape was a game changer in the television industry. Before tape, everything had to be performed live in front of a camera or printed in an awkward way to 16 millimeter film in what's called a kinescope. A kinescope is basically a film camera pointed at a TV screen. It's like a recording TV show with your phone. It's not the best way. Now, kinescopes never worked very well. The film was expensive to use. A videotape was much higher quality and it could be recycled. This allowed television networks to record their live shows to tape and then play them back in a different time zone without really losing any quality. Problem was, all you could do is record to the tape. If you want to make an edit, you would have to splice a tape about where you think the edit should be, then apply a magnetic developer to the tape, which reveals the magnetic stripes on which the analog signal is recorded. Oh yeah, you need a, a microscope in order to see these stripes. You would locate where the frame actually ended, the vertical blanking period for the outgoing tape and trim off any excess, and then do the same for the incoming tape, cutting off any excess before the frame started. If your edit splice is in the wrong location, then your image would be scrambled and you'd have to start all over again. So that was a technique for making a single cut with videotape. To organize how you would want to make a large number of accurate cuts for an edit, well, you had to get a little crafty as the engineers at NBC did. Now they created a master 73 minute frame accurate audio track called the Edit Sync Guide using a series of beeps and voices counting down the time, which sounded like this. 53, 54, 12, 56. Now this sync guide was applied to the cue track of the original tape. Then a kinescope was made from the tape 
with the Q-Track intact. The edits were made to the 16mm kinescope in the old fashioned film editing way and the engineers used the audio sync guide of the 16mm film to create a list of edits. With this list they went back to the original tape and matched up with the audio sync guide Q-Track on the original video to make each of the individual splices. Complicated, right? But it worked. The first use of the sync guide was the Fred Astaire special in 1958. It worked so well that when Fred Astaire told his friends about the accuracy of NBC's edit sync guide, a flood of television producers came to NBC to get their video projects edited, which NBC gladly did for a fee. Now, it was clear that frame accurate time code was a necessity for video editing, but it would take a decade before a standard came into place. Now, throughout the years, Ampex continued making improvements on their video recorder, adding Q tracks to help identify the vertical blanking period. In the early 60s, Ampex released the Electronic Editor, a way to make tape splices electronically. No more microscopes and razor blades. Unfortunately, this also had been mockingly referred to as the punch and pray, as the operator had to press the record button exactly one half second before the edit was to occur. And of course, there was no way to fix a mistake. But improvements kept coming from Ampex. In 1963, they introduced the Edit Tech to streamline operation of the electronic editor. An editor operator would watch the tape and mark edit points, and the edit tech would record electronic pulses on the tape's audio cue track, which were fed to the electronic editor to make the edit. Still, there was the issue of clock drift that plagued the system, which of course Ampex sold a solution for in the Amtech compensator. So if you kitted out your Ampex video recorder, you could have a frame accurate videotape editing system by 1963. I mean, sure, it cost a small fortune. That original VRX 1000 went for $50,000 in 1956. And the electronic editor and Editech were add-ons that cost $13,600 together. In 2019 dollars, that would upgrade alone would be north of hundred grand. Even though it was frame accurate, it was still pretty crude. So a time code space race was on. And one of the first competitors was a small company out of Santa Ana, California, the Electronic Engineering Company, or EECO. And EECO had actually been building timing clocks for the Air Force and NASA going back to the X-15 flights of the 1950s. They turned their timing prowess to the television and broadcast industries, and in 1967 introduced a proprietary time code system called On Time and the EECO 900 electronic editor that could read it. Now other companies joined in the time code race like Central Dynamics Limited and Datatron, each creating their own proprietary time code formats. By 1970, there was marketplace confusion as time code tapes from one television studio could not be read, in another they used a different system. SEMTI, the overseeing television body, assembled a panel to pick one universal time code format. On October 6, 1970, the SEMTI time code was proposed based largely on the EECO on time standard with some modifications. But the best part was this new SEMTI time code could be applied to any brand time code generator on the market with only minor, uh, what we would, we would call today a firmware update. It would take another five years until April 2nd, 1975, that the SEMTI timecode standard became official and approved by the American National Standards Institute. But by then, timecode was already an essential part of every television studio across the country. The SEMTI time code first made official in 1975 was so robust that it had hardly changed even up to this day. In fact, because the system is so stable, other venues like live theater and musical performances have incorporated the same time code system whenever they need precise synchronization. But in the video world, you will see essentially two kinds of time code, LTC or longitudinal time code or VITC, 
vertical interval time code. Let's start with the LTC. LTC time code is recorded onto an audio track using a square wave. The bits are encoded using differential Manchester encoding, sometimes called biphase mark encoding. What this essentially means is the stream encodes both the data and the clock into the data stream, which makes the signal self-clocking, which is a good thing for something like time code. In this encoding, a zero has a single transition at the beginning of the period, whereas a one bit has two transitions at the beginning and middle of the period. LTC time code consists of 80 bits. 26 bits make up the numbers in the hours, minutes, seconds, and frames. 32 bits are available as user definable bits. Six bits make up various flags and markers. And then the last 16 bits make up a sync word, which starts with zero, zero, and is followed by 12 ones, which can never happen in any other part of the time code data stream, and a zero one at the end. The zero, zero, and zero, one of the sync word tell the player whether the time code is playing forward or backward. This is the sound of LTC time code. Not the prettiest thing, but it's robust. Now over time, the practice of vertical interval time code or VTC started working its way into tapes and linear editing. VTC takes the same 80 bit time code as LTC, adds 10 more bits and replaces the sync word with a checksum. This 90 bit time code word is placed in the vertical blanking interval between each field of video with a special marker denoting either the upper or lower field in a interlaced video stream. Now the advantage of VTC over LTC were that you didn't lose a track of audio to time code and you could get frame accuracy at very slow playback speeds, even in freeze frame. LTC time code requires the playback to be rolling so you can actually read the audio signal. But where VTC could read a still frame, it was prone to distortion from video issues. And VTC could, couldn't be read like LTC when the tape was rewinding at very fast speed. When video started going digital, the VTC analog signal was developed into the digital vertical interval time code. And because component digital video didn't have vertical blanking intervals, engineers developed, began hiding time code signals into the vertical ancillary data space and format to look like video samples. We won't go further into those systems because they weren't widely used and frankly quickly replaced by the file systems we have today where the time code is embedded in the file either at the header or in some form of metadata. Now, in terms of frame rate, SMPT originally only provided for a handful of frame rates. In NTSC land, you had a choice between 23.976 and 29.97. In PAL land, you had an even 24 or an even 25. An update to the SMPT time code has added the ability to count subframes by using up to five flags, which allows time code to count 32 times of the super frame rate. So the maximum frame rate possible now is 32 times 30 or 960 frames per second. Of course, these extra frame rates are not widely implemented. The highest I've seen are 59.97 and 60. But let's go back and talk about those oddball frame rates of NTSC. If we use 29.97 frames per second as our frame rate and count up to one hour using our time code generator, our time code clock would be behind the real clock by 3.6 seconds. That may not seem like much, but hour after hour, those 3.6 seconds add up. Within a day, the clock would be off by more than a minute. After a month, the time code clock would be off by 43 minutes. Obviously, that was not going to work for a TV station. Now, we could jam sync our time code clock every day or so with a real world clock, but this can introduce a lot of errors. Instead, what engineers developed was a counting system called drop frame, which corrects this issue. Now, contrary to what it sounds, no frames are actually dropped in drop code time a drop frame time code. Think of it more as reverse leap year. Instead of adding a day every four years, we just skip certain numbered frames. Let's examine the drift after one minute of video. A minute of true 30 frames per second video has 1800 frames. A minute of 29.97 frames per second video has 
two frames of video. We have to make up that extra 1.8 frames after one minute of video. So when we count frames of 29.97, we go from 59 seconds and 29 frames to one minute and two frames. We skipped one minute, zero frames and one minute, one frames. Now we're 0.2 frames ahead of the real clock. So, so fast forward to the next minute. Again, we skip counting two minutes and zero and two minutes and one frame and go straight from one minute 59, 29 to two minutes and two frames. Now we're 0.4 frames ahead. We continue doing this, dropping two frames at the start of each minute till we get to the 10th minute. Now we're 1.8 frames ahead. So the 10th minute, we don't skip counting any frames. We go from 959, 29 to 10 minutes even, and then 1001, and so on. So now 10 minutes of our 2997 frames per second drop frame is exactly the same as 10 minutes in the real world. Now that does sound a bit confusing, but you will never ever need to manually count frames like that. That's the editing computer's job. And you can often switch between drop frame and non-drop frame depending on the needs of your project. Drop frame is de designated with semicolons between the numbers or a period before the frame count, whereas non-drop frame uses colons. Now you really only need drop frame if you're formatting something to be going on broadcast television. If you're working on a movie or a video for the web, you can work safely without drop frame. And remember, no frames are actually being dropped. It's only a matter of how we count the frames. So you can switch between the two and the only thing that will change is your total running time of your project. Well, now that you're well-versed in timecode history and science, let's talk about how timecode actually works in a production environment. Now, if you're shooting with just one camera and a recording and recording audio straight into that camera, there's obviously a little need for you to involve yourself with timecode other than for organizational and note-taking purposes. But if you send sound to an off-camera recorder, or if you're using multiple cameras, recording synchronized timecode on each device will make syncing in post much simpler. Now, it's important to remember that timecode does not automatically sync the cameras. It syncs the clocks. It provides a highly accurate reference clock, which allows multiple cameras and sound sources to be synchronized in post-production. But if you need subframe accuracy to sync the camera's frames precisely, say for a dual camera 3D rig, you'll need generation locking. Genlock in the standard deaf days used to involve sending a black burst signal from a central switcher. In the HD world, Genlock is accomplished with tri-level sync. Now, but Genlock is more for live switching situations and isn't always practical and frankly not entirely necessary for typical script-based work. What you want to do is what they do in spy movies before the start of every mission. Synchronize your watches. Now get your timecode clocks to be all in sync. Now I've tried to do this manually by going to the menus and resetting the timecode on multiple devices at the same time, but I've never been able to do it with any degree of frame accuracy. Besides, manufacturers of many cameras don't put that much stock into the long-term precision of their clocks. After all, they're focused on the sensor and processing and creating a beautiful image. So camera clocks can drift, especially after they've been powered off for say a battery change. The much better solution is to feed a timecode signal into the cameras and devices from a dedicated timecode generator like the Nano Locket from our sponsor Ambient. The Nano Locket is really quite a unique and simple device to operate. To set it up, I attach the Nano Locket to a computer and run Ambient's Locket toolbox. I sync the Nano Locket to the computer's clock and select the timecode format. Since I'm in the NTSE world, that's really a choice between 23.98 or 29.97, and PAL has a choice between 25 and 24. Higher frame rates up to true 60 are available as well, and the 29.97 and 59.94 have drop frame varieties available. Now, since I film in 24, I would select 23.98. Now, once everything is set in the Locket toolbox, I can disconnect the Nano Locket and it's ready to go. This little box will generate a time code signal all day and night until it runs out of battery, which is about 25 hours or longer after a two hour charge. It charges using a basic USB five volt port. You can conceivably just run it from an external battery source so it can run indefinitely. If I have a second nano locket or even this ambient locket slate, 
All I have to do to jam sync them together is take the nano locket that I had set up earlier and press and hold the green button. Immediately, all the other devices sync up frame rate and time code. Now, if I'm feeding a device with a time code input like this Zoom F8N, I just connect the nano locket to the recorder using the appropriate adapter. Set the time code either to external or internal free run and jam the internal clock to the external time code. Now you would do the same thing for a professional camera that has a time code in. But for cameras that don't have time code input, I just use either the Limo to XLR adapter or Limo to mini jack adapter and send the signal as an audio source to the camera. Make sure the audio levels are strong, but not peaking. Then when we're in post, we have to decode that LTC audio timecode. Right now, only Avid and DaVinci Resolve can read LTC audio timecode. There are a few standalone products out there as well. Well, since I am a Premiere user, I can use the free version of DaVinci Resolve, bring in my clips, select update timecode from audio LTC, and then export these clips back out for editing, or just manually transfer each starting timecode back into Premiere. Now in Premiere, I can sort my files by timecode and merge video and audio files using the timecode as sync. This works great for shooting a dual audio system, like shooting a short film. On the set of our latest filmmaker IQ short out of sync, I ran the nano locket into the Canon C200's audio channel while monitoring and recording sound on my F8N. The digital slate also worked well as a visual reference for the timecode. You can also use it on a multi-cam documentary shoot feeding the same time code to two different cameras using two nano locket devices. But perhaps my favorite recent use was in recording a classical concert. I have a pair of mics which I position on the stage to record the orchestra and plug into my F8N. These are my go-to sound mics. Then I positioned my cameras in the tech booth a couple hundred feet away and fed an audio feed from their soundboard for any live mics that they might be using. I jam synced my recorder to the nano locket and then brought the nano locket up to the booth to feed an LTC audio signal into my camera. Now before, I was always having a beast of a time trying to get the stage audio, which I really wanted, to sync up with the camera audio, which also had the live audio. If I relied on natural sound from the camera being so far from the orchestra, it would always be behind because the sound takes a lot longer to travel that distance than does light. Now this would be especially difficult if I was trying to mix my stage audio with the board feed because the board feed travels at the speed of light, so it's always ahead of the natural sound. And that sound is a terrible way to try to sync. Well, with the Nano Locket, I have identical time code for both the camera and the recorder on stage, so there's no question about how to sync these feeds. From its humble origin in linear tape editing, timecode has stayed strong as an important factor in keeping our digital motion picture world together. I hope you've gotten some perspective on how timecode works and consider how you might implement timecode generators like the Ambient Nano Locket to help make your productions easier. It made our short film Out of Sync a whole lot simpler to sync, which I hope you will check out very soon. Till next time, my friends, sync up your clocks and make something great. I'm John Hess. I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com.